Yes. All right. So looking at the package, do you, do you recognize it and how you recognize it? Yes, I do recognize it by the yellow unique FDLE sticker with the case number and the exhibit number, um, as well as my own personal markings on the outside of this packaging um, with the case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. In what condition was that package when you received it? It was received in a sealed condition. May I refer to my notes, please? Uh, with, yes. With the court's permission, if you need that to refresh your recollection. Yes, I do. You may. Thank you. In this package, I received one fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. So first and foremost, they are both the same caliber. So the type of ammunition that's designed to be fired in this type of firearm is a 9 millimeter Luger. So when I first start my examination, the first thing I'm going to look at as sort of a sorting tool is to see whether or not I have calibers of fired ammunition that match up with my firearm to determine if there is a comparison that can be done between them. Okay. Now Yes, I did. Was there anything you did to it to help you recognize it like you did with the firearm in the magazine? Yes, so there is an abbreviated case number that I wrote in the mouth or inside of the cartridge case with the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Can you take that particular cartridge case out um, and see if the guy in the Yes, it is. Okay. Now, you entered, entered in where someone else has entered into that package here in court. Do you see where you originally entered into that package? Yes, I do. Can you show the jury how they recognize that? On this side here, um, where my initial cut was made, I then sealed that, um, that portion that was cut for return. Uh, you can see it says evidence, FDLE OROC, um, with my initials and the date of seal on, on this red evidence seal here. Is that how that package left your possession after you were done working with the evidence? Yes, it is. Now, I wanna, can you pick it up and show the jury what a 9 millimeter cartridge case looks like in general? So this is the fired cartridge case. Um, so when I talk about a cartridge, that's an unfired unit of ammunition. So that would have this cartridge case. Um, at the base or head of that would be a primer, which is seated right in the middle there. That holds um, the ignition. Um, inside this cartridge case would also hold the gunpowder. And then at the top of it would be loaded the bullet. So that would be an entire cartridge or unit of ammunition. So once the firing process happens, that firing pin will come and strike this bottom portion of the cartridge. Uh, that will ignite the gunpowder that's in here, that will send the bullet out of the mouth of this cartridge case, and then the extraction and ejection of this cartridge case would happen. Now, does the cartridge case have something on it that lets you know who manufactured it and the type of uh, cartridge it is, how it was? Yes, it does. So there's what's called a head stamp. So on this... Um, rear or head stamp portion of the cartridge case. It has both a manufacturer stamp and the caliber. Um, so this says WIN, W-I-N, which stands for Winchester, um, and 9 millimeter Luger, which is again the type of ammunition um, designed to be shot in a particular firearm. Okay, can you put that cartridge case back into the, uh, the exhibit? And then can you look at, we, we've been using an exhibit number on the other side of the bag, 
was there some writing? It's exhibit number 55, but on the back of the bag, does it have a description of what letter or numbers associated with the exhibit and um, where the exhibit was recovered? Um, the exhibit that I have, which my reference is for this, is MDE. Um, and the information on the outside of this envelope says spent casing in driveway. And I'm putting exhibit 97 up on the view screen. So that was E, M, D, E. That is correct. Can you set that aside? Because we're going to be talking about a lot. 27. <clears throat> Can you pick up, is it 56, the next one that's on the pile? Yes. Right. Same questions about recognition. Do you recognize the item from the exterior packaging? Yes, in the same manner. The FDLE sticker and my markings on the outer packaging. Do you, um, when you received that item, what condition was it? It was received in a sealed condition. And in looking at the item now, do you see where you would have entered into that package? Yes, I do. And is, that, is, is your seal still intact on the package? Yes, it is along the side. Now, uh, what did you find in that package when you, did you opened it up? Well, obviously you opened it up. What did you find in the package when you opened it up? Yes, I did. Again, I found another um, single-fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Uh, this has been designated Exhibit MDF. Okay, so F is the last, last letter on it? That is correct. And um, can you look inside the package and see what, what you found in there is in there today? Yes, it is. Again, I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. So you're able to associate with that case, and it's the item that you place back in the package and seal it up when you're done with it? That is correct. Is, is that the, in looking at the head stamp on that cartridge case, does it appear to be the same type and, and manufacturer, or is it a different manufacturer? It is the same Winchester 9mm Luger. It was received in a sealed condition. Are there things on there on the exterior of the package that let you know you've seen that before, examined it, and reached some opinions and conclusions about it? Yes, again, my markings, and there is a seal along the side with my initials and the date. When you went into that uh, package, what did you find? Uh, one fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. So the same. Yes, the same caliber. Um, can you look inside the package and satisfy yourself that what is in there was in there when you opened it is in there today? Yes, it is. Okay. And how is it you're able to write? by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the unique exhibit number, and my initials. And um, is it a cartridge case that you, as we talked about, a 9mm cartridge case? Yes, it is a fired cartridge case. And is it of the same manufacturer or different manufacturer as the other two we talked about? The same. It's also a Winchester 9mm Luger. Okay. And what number or letter did the law enforcement place on that exhibit? It's exhibit M D G. Ask you to put that back into the container and then move on to I believe it's exhibit 58. Is that exhibit 
Yes, yes, it is. Yes, I do, by the FDLE case number, my markings, and my seals on the outer packaging. And uh, what was the condition of the package when you received it? It was received in a sealed condition. And when you entered into the packaging, what did you find? It was one fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Yes, I did. Um, ask you to open up the package and, and determine whether or not the item you took out of there is in there today. <clears throat> yes, it is, and I recognize that again by the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials written on this piece of evidence. Yes, it is. And is it of the same make or manufacturer as the other? Yes, it is. Winchester and 9mm Luger cartridge case. That is correct. I ask you to place that back in. The last thing I'm going to ask you to do after you do that is to tell us the um, number or letter that's associated with that exhibit by the time it was originated. And this is exhibit MDH. Uh, 59. 59? Okay. <clears throat> you recognize the item by looking at the exterior packaging? Yes, I recognize the case number, the exhibit number, my initials, and also my outer seal. What was the condition of the item when it came into your possession? It was in a sealed condition. Did you enter into the packaging? Yes, I did. Do you see where you entered? Yes, I do. Yes, and it is still intact. What did you find inside the package when you entered into it? A fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you open the package and satisfy yourself whether or not that's the item you placed in there when you were done with your examination? Yes, I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. And um, what is it that you, that you have in your hands now? What, is it the same manufacturer as the last few? Or is it different? Yes, it's a fired Winchester 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Same, same manufacturer as the last group? Yes, it is. Um, and what number letter did the Titus Bill Exhibit MDI. That's exhibit, which I'm assuming is 60? Yes. All right. Do you recognize the packaging as something you've dealt with? Yes, the FDLE sticker, um, my handwritten case number, exhibit number, initials, then also my outer seal, which is intact, with my initials and date on it. When you received the package, what condition was it in? In a sealed condition. When you entered into the package, what did you find? A fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Can you open up the package and satisfy that what you uh, found in there last time is in there today? Yes, it is. Okay. And you're looking at the markings that you placed on it? That is correct. It's the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials are written in the mouth or this open portion of the cartridge case. Um, is the manufacturer the same, Winchester or something else? 
It is a Winchester 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Put that back uh, in the package and tell us what number or whether uh, the original agency is associated with that exhibit. Exhibit MDJ. Is there a 61 with knife in the pond? Yes. Right. And uh, look, looking at the package, do you recognize it? Yes, I recognize the FDLE sticker, the case number, the, um, the FDLE number, the exhibit number, my initials, uh, my seal on the side with my initials and date. And uh, when you uh, entered into that package, what did you find? A fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. And could you enter into that package and determine whether or not the item that you uh, found in there and Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And the uh, manufacturer on that cartridge case, is it the same or uh, Winchester or something? Yes, it's a Winchester 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case that is fired. Right. After you put the item back in the exhibit, can you tell us how the originating agency labeled that particular exhibit? It was labeled as exhibit MDK. Again, do you recognize the packaging as something that you dealt with in this case? Yes, the FDLE number, exhibit number, my initials, again, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. When you entered into that package, what did you find? One fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you enter into the package and determine whether or not the item that you recovered from the package? Yes, it is. I recognize it by the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials written on this cartridge case. Now, uh, the manufacturer of that particular cartridge case, can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so this has a head stamp of FC 9mm Luger, which is a federal brand cartridge case. Right. So it's a different brand of cartridge <laughs> case, but is it designed to fire in the same weapon? Yes, it's still a 9 millimeter Luger, so it's still the same type of ammunition, even with a different manufacturing head stamp. Okay. Now, can you put that back in the uh, container and tell us how the originating uh, agency labeled or identified it? It was identified as Exhibit MDL. I believe we're on 63. But, um, that is correct. Can you look at the package and satisfy yourself whether or not you recognize that as something that you examined in this case? Yes, the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the intact outer seal with my initials, and the date. And when you entered into that package, what did you find? A fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Was the package sealed before you entered? Yes, it was. Could you open the package and satisfy yourself that what you took out of that package is placed back in and is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials. Can you place the item back into the container and tell us what the original? It's exhibit MDM. Um, I believe the next uh, exhibit is number 64. Yes. Do you recognize the packaging as something that you investigated in this particular case? Yes. Again, I recognize the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. Yes, it was. When you look, uh, what did you find in the package when you, um, when you opened it up? 
It was one fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials. If you place that item back in the package, you need to tell us uh, how the originating agency labeled that particular material. This is exhibit MD1. Uh, I believe we're on 65? Yes. Yes, the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, uh, the outer seal, which is still intact with my initials, and uh, the date. And uh, what did you find? In, well, was the, were the seals intact before you entered into the packaging? Yes, they were. And after you entered into the packaging, what did you find in the exhibit? A fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you open the package and satisfy that what you took out and put back in there is in there too? <laughs> yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Place that back into the package and then tell us what the as exhibit MD2. And the uh, next exhibit, which I believe is going to be 56. Yes. Can you look at the package and tell us whether or not you recognize it? Yes, the agency number, or the FDLE number, um, the exhibit number, my initials, the intact outer seal with my initials and date. Was the item sealed when you received it? Yes, it was. One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. And uh, did you open the pack and satisfy yourself that what's in there is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. <laughs> manufacturer of that particular exhibit? This is a Blazer, B-L-A-Z-E-R, 9 millimeter Luger caliber fired cartridge case. And is Blazer the company like uh, Federal and Winchester? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, can you put that item back into the packaging and uh, tell us how the agency This is exhibit MDN. that everyone can see and okay okay showing you what's been marked is exhibit 93 do you recognize that exhibit yes i do by the fdle case number the exhibit number my initials of uh, the seal which is still intact on the outer packaging my initials and the date okay and uh what was the condition of the item when you received it it was received in a sealed condition um when you entered into the packaging what did you a fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Can you open the package and determine whether or not the item that you found in there, placed back in there, is in there today? Yes, it is. I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. You recognize the manufacturer on that exhibit? 
Yes, this has a WIN, so Winchester head stamp with nine millimeter Luger caliber. Place the item back in there, and then if you could tell us what letter or number the originating agency associated with this exhibit. Exhibit MD26. Sonia, what's been marked as exhibit 86? Recognize that exhibit? Yes, by the FDLE number, the exhibit number, my initials, excuse me, uh, the evidence seal on the outside, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And uh, when you received that item, in what condition was it? In a sealed condition. And did you enter into that package and uh, locate a piece of evidence that you used in this case? Yes, I did. A fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you open the package and determine whether or not the item that you examined and uh, put back into the package and here it is today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. And uh, what type of manufacturer is on the head stamp? Winchester. Put the item back in there and tell us how the originating agency labeled this particular exhibit. This is exhibit MD15. Showing you what's been marked as exhibit 85. Ask if you recognize that exhibit. Yes, by the FDLE number, the exhibit number, my initials. The packaging has a seal of mine that's still intact with my initials and the date. And um, did it, had the package been, uh, was the package sealed when you received it? Yes, I received it in a sealed condition. When you opened the package, what did you find in the package? One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you open the package to determine whether or not the item you placed in there after you were done with your examination is in there today? Yes, it is. I recognize the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And uh, the manufacturer of that particular uh, cartridge case? Is Winchester. And what... Uh, Item number did the originating agency associate with that particular cartridge case? Exhibit MD14. Tony, what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 84? Ask if you recognize that exhibit as something that you examined in this case. Yes, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials. Again, the intact seal on the outside of this envelope with my initials uh, in the date. In what condition was the package when you received it? A sealed condition. Uh, what did you find, find in the package when you entered into it? One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Did you open the package and satisfy yourself that what you examined in that, from that package and placed back in there is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And um, what manufacturer uh, is on the head stamp for that particular exhibit? Winchester. What item number did the originating agency uh, associate that exhibit with? Exhibit MD13. Show you what's been marked as State Exhibit 84. 
ask if you recognize the packaging. Um, yes, I believe this is the one that we just um, oh, I'm sorry. went over. Yeah. These ones were done. Yes. Going to what's been marked as State's Exhibit 83. Yes. Do you recognize that exhibit? I do. The FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, um, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And um, what was the condition of the package when you received it? A sealed condition. And do you, <clears throat> uh, what did you find when you entered into the package? One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. And uh, could you satisfy that what you located in and tested in that package is in there today? Yes, by the abbreviated FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And um, what, who is the manufacturer of that particular cartridge? Winchester. And the uh, identifying letter or number by the agency? Is exhibit MDP. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 82. <clears throat> Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And um, what was the condition of the package when you received it? It was received in a sealed condition. And what did you find in there upon entering it? One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. <clears throat> Could you open the package and satisfy yourself that what uh, you found in there and uh, perform an examination on is it in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLA case number, exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. And the manufacturer of that uh, cartridge? It's Winchester. I ask you to place that back in and then uh, indicate the identifying uh, number or letter that is associated with that particular exhibit. Exhibit MDO. I'm going to change the exhibit up on the view screen. show you what's been marked as Exhibit 142 and ask if you recognize that particular exhibit. I do by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal which is still intact with my initials and the date. And what was the condition of the package when you received it? It was received in the sealed condition. When you opened up the package, what did you find inside? One fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Could you open up the package and determine whether or not the, I think it's at the top. Okay, thank you. Um, the same item that you found in the package originally is in there today. Yes, I had recognized the abbreviated FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And who was the manufacturer of that particular cartridge case? This has a head stamp of R slash P, which stands for Remington. Okay. And uh, still a 9 millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case, though. Still fit in the same firearm. That is correct, yes. Okay. Put that back in the packaging and then tell us what letter or number was associated with that particular Exhibit CH3. 
to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 143 um, and ask if you recognize the, the exhibit from the package. Yes, the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, uh, my intact seal on the side here with my initials and the date. And the condition of the, uh, of the exhibit when you received it? It was received in a sealed condition. Now, when you entered into the packaging, what did you find? One fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. And you look inside the package and satisfy yourself as to whether or not the same item that you took out and performed examination on is in there today. Yes, I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials. And the manufacturer of the cartridge? This has a Spear, S-P-E-E-R head stamp, uh, but again, it is 9mm Luger caliber, so it's compatible with the same firearm. Okay, put that back in and then let us know what letter or number was associated with that particular exhibit. Exhibit C-H-4. Going to what's been marked as case exhibit 144, ask you to look at the packaging and see if you recognize that as something that you entered into and performed some testing. Yes, I recognize the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the intact seal that I placed on here with my initials and date. Okay. And when you received the exhibit, in what condition was it in? It was in a sealed condition. What did you find in the exhibit upon entering into the package? This exhibit contained five fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge cases. And um, can you check and see that the items that you received uh, from law enforcement are in the package today after you finished your examination? individual packages inside? Yes, each fired cartridge case is in its own sealed manila envelope, uh, which appears to still be in a sealed condition. Um, I do, however, recognize um, an abbreviated case number with the exhibit number and my initials on the outside of this packaging. Uh, plus, I do recognize my initials on the seal at the top of this packaging. Uh, uh, are all of the uh, casings packaged in the same uh, type of container inside the bag? Yes, they are. They're all in sealed manila envelopes. All right. Now, is that something you did or is that how you received them? No, I was rece they were received to me that way from the agency. Right. Can you look inside the packaging and satisfy yourself that what you, uh, did you open up each of these packages and then place them back up and seal them again? Yeah, so what I did was I opened each of these individual envelopes um, and then I marked each of those with an additional identifier. Um, so the agency exhibit number is CHS. I then also further designated them one through five so that they would be individually marked from one another. Okay. And you happen to have one in your hand? or Yes, I do. All right. Can you open up uh, that particular package and satisfy yourself that what you examined uh, from, from the exhibit is in that particular package today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. And who manufactured that particular uh, cartridge? This is a Winchester, again, 9mm Luger. Okay. And, um, and that was number one? That is correct. Uh, let's move on to number the package that has number two on it. And ask you to open that package as well, determine whether or not the exhibit that you examined is in there. Yes, I recognize the FDLE case number, the exhibit number with a further designation of two, and my initials. Okay. And manufacturer? This is a CBC manufacturer. Okay. 
What does that mean? Uh, that's just the name of the manufacturer, okay. CBC. All right. Uh, can you place that uh, uh, exhibit back in the package number two? And is that the same nine millimeter Luger uh, cartridge as the other ones we've been talking about? Yes, it is the same caliber. Can you uh, get number package number three and open it and satisfy yourself that what you, you tested is in there today? Yes, I recognize the FDLE case number. Again, the further designation of three on this cartridge case and my initials. And the manufacturer of that cartridge? Is Winchester. Okay. And the same nine millimeter Luger caliber. And number four, package number four, satisfy yourself that what you found and tested is in there today. Yes, by the FDLE case number. Again, the further designation of four and my uh, initials. Okay. And the manufacturer of that particular uh, cartridge? This again is CBC, um, but it is still a nine millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. Okay. <clears throat> and container number five. Yes, by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number with the further designation of five, and my initials. And the manufacturer? This is a federal 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. And all five of those were labeled in the package as number what on the original submitted in the bag? The outer package has this as exhibit CHS. Show you what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 145, and ask if you recognize the item from the packaging. I do, by the FDLE case number, Exhibit number, my initials, the outer evidence seal, which is still intact of mine, with my initials and the date. And um, when you look inside, what what did you find in there when you opened the package? It was one fired nine millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. And could you look inside the package and satisfy yourself that what you took out and tested is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. And... Uh, who is the manufacturer of the cart cartridge case? Winchester. Put that back in and tell us how the, uh, that particular piece of evidence was labeled by law enforcement. Exhibit C-H-T. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 146. Ask if you recognize the exhibit from the package. I do, from the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And what condition was the item when you received it? It was received in a sealed condition. And um, what did you find in the package when you opened it? One fired 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. <clears throat> and could you open the package and satisfy that what, what you found and tested in there is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. And the manufacturer on that particular exhibit? Is Winchester. I ask you to put that back in there and, and tell us how, the, uh, how law enforcement uh, identified that particular exhibit. Exhibit CH5. Okay. 
Now, all these exhibits that we've been talking about since we talked about the fireman the magazine were of the same nature. Were they not? They were all tin cartridge casings? They were, and they were all 9 millimeter Luger caliber. Okay. Now, is there something that you can do with a cartridge case to determine the firearm that it would have been fired in? Yes, there are. And did you do that on all 27 of these exhibits that we just went through uh, each cartridge case? I think we went through 27 cartridge cases, did we not? Yes. Did you perform an examination on all these cartridge cases uh, to attempt to determine the originating firearm or what firearm that they were fired from? Yes, I microscopically compared each one of these fired cartridge cases. Now, how do you get a known sample uh, or to compare to? How do, you, how do you have something to compare to these cartridge cases that are found in a crime scene? So when I first do my examination of the firearm, um, I'm, my first step is just a visual examination. So I'm cataloging the information from the firearm. So that's where I find out that it's a 9 millimeter Luger. Um, the caliber is physically stamped on this firearm itself. Um, I then personally test fire this firearm um, that serves two purposes. Uh, first, I'm checking to see whether it is a functioning firearm. And then secondarily, I'm also getting known standards to that firearm. So I know that those fired cartridge cases and bullets were fired from this gun because I did it myself. Those are then my known standards that I'll do any and all microscopic comparisons with. Uh, so I will look under a comparison microscope. So that's two compound microscopes that are connected with an optic bridge that allows me to compare two items side by side with one another. So I compare my known standard. So I'm going to look to see what is reproducing on that firearm and then introduce any unknowns to see if I see similarities or not to that firearm. Okay. And um, so similarities indicate that the firearm uh, could come from, could have come, I mean the cartridge case could have come from Yes, yeah, so what I'm looking at um, are two different types of marks. So there are class characteristics and individual characteristics. So the class characteristics, it's sort of a, um, an initial screening tool. So in this case, 9 millimeter Luger is a class characteristic. So that's something that the manufacturer has determined prior to making this firearm, that it is going to be a 9 millimeter Luger caliber. Um, so you can think if you walk into a parking lot and you're looking for your white Ford F-150, that's a class characteristic. So you can remove every vehicle that's in that lot except for Ford F-150s. So it narrows down a huge pool to a smaller one. Uh, once I have that smaller pool and know that there are similarities um, that I can move forward in an examination, then I'm going to look at what's called individual characteristics. So those are tiny microscopic surface imperfections that get on that firearm from incidental to the manufacturing process. So it's not on purpose. Um, it may be the tool is chipping, um, the actual metal itself, and then also the use and abuse of that firearm. So those individual characteristics are what make it unique. So if we go back to the parking lot analogy, you know, there might be a hundred Ford F-150s in that parking lot, but you know that yours has a vanity license plate, a small dent on the left-hand side, and pink fuzzy dice in the mirror. So once you've determined that that is your vehicle, then that's the individual characteristics that then isolate it from the other ones. Now, are there multiple locations that you can look at a cartridge case to uh, make a comparison and a potential identification? Yes, there are. So when that cartridge, so the unfired unit of ammunition, when that's loaded in that firearm during that firing process, those gases are going to slam that cartridge case back against the breech or rear portion of that firearm. So it'll pick up markings not only from the firing pin that is going forward and actually striking the primer of that cartridge case, but then that cartridge case will also get markings from the rear portion of that firearm itself. 
Um, so it's a branch of what's called tool mark identification. So when two objects come into contact with each other, the tool is the harder of the two objects. So in this case, you can think of the firearm as the tool, where the cartridge case is a much softer material. So it's going to pick up those tiny surface imperfections that are on that firearm and make an impression, a sort of stamp that is on that cartridge case. So that using a microscope is what I'm looking at to see those tiny microscopic surface imperfections um, that appear in patterns and matching those patterns potentially to any unknowns. Okay, so I'm going to use one of the, I think it's the last one, which is exhibit 146. I'm Can you tell us what we're looking at on the view screen right now? Sure. So you can, it's a little sideways, but you can see um, so with the, oh, sure. thank you. Um, so you can see here, it says nine millimeter Luger. Um, and I believe that is WIN. It's a little difficult to see with the tarnish from here. Um, so this portion here is the head stamp portion. So that's where, when I tell you that it's a Winchester 9mm Luger, that's where that information is coming from. And this inner circle here, that is the primer. So this is primarily the, um, the area that is coming into t contact with that rear portion of the firearm. And then this even smaller inner circle right here is the firing pin impression. So that's where the firing pin is hitting that primer and detonating that gunpowder that's within that cartridge case. So all of these areas will come up with markings from the firearm. So we have both our firing pin and the breech face marks. Okay. And did you use any particular uh, areas to aid you in including or excluding uh, this uh, cartridge case, thin cartridge case from the known cartridge cases that you'd obtain in your workup with this firearm. Yes, yeah, so the first step of my examination on these is to see whether or not those class characteristics are similar to one another. Um, there can be different sizes and shapes of firing pins. Um, this one, as you can see, uh, is pretty circular. And they do have ones that are square, that are more um, rectangular. So if that were a case and I had a cartridge case like that and it did not coincide with my firearm, you know, that's a pretty easy screening tool for that being the end of my examination. Once I determine, however, that those class characteristics, pardon me, are in line, then I move on to examine those individual characteristics. So I am evaluating both those breech face marks, so sort of that middle ring and that inner ring of the firing pin impression. Right. Now, I, I've got this up on, on a view screen. How are you looking at this? Um, so that you can see the things that you need to see. So when I'm looking at it, you can picture it like how you would look in any microscope. So you have those two eyepieces that you're going to look at. However, on most microscopes, you have a single stage. So you're just going to look at one thing. If you can think back to maybe high school chemistry or biology where you put that little slide under and you're just looking at that single item that's on your stage. In my case, I actually have two of those. So I'm able to look at two microscopes at the same time using a single set of eyepieces. And that way I can maneuver those two items into the same view so that I can see them right side by side and on top of one another. Okay. And how does that um, aid you in what you're attempting to do here, which is include or exclude this, uh, uh, an exhibit from a known sample? Right, so that way I'm able to look at a further magnification of what those markings look at look like. So from this distance, you know, you can see that there is, you know, a mark there. There is a circle there. However, um, to look at those finer marks in there, um, we're not able to see that just with the naked eye. It does require further um, further magnification using a microscope. Okay, and uh, when you were uh, looking to after you got past the common uh, class characteristics, did you go to spe specific areas on the cartridge case that you were looking to include or exclude uh, each cartridge, each of these cartridge cases from the known sample? 
Yes, yeah, so every single cartridge case was evaluated um, for those markings. All right. And what did you find? What were your findings? My findings were that all of these cartridge cases were identified as having been fired in this firearm. Okay. And were there, were there particular areas where you, you found the uh, uh, individual characteristics? Uh, like from the breech face or the firing pin or somewhere else on the cartridge case that that led to you reaching this conclusion? Uh, yes, um, while I did see similarities, however, my identification um, was mainly focused on the firing pin impression and those individual characteristics that were on there. Okay, so the identifications that you're making on, uh, on these 27 cartridge cases as far as it being fired from, the, from that gun that's sitting up there with you, is that what you're, you're telling us? Yes, that is correct. That, those cart that these cartridge, 27 cartridge cases were fired from that firearm, and you're telling it us that's from the uh, impression uh, where the firing pin struck the cartridge case. That is correct. And you look at each of these exhibits, uh, each of these cartridge cases, That is correct. Every single cartridge case in this case was observed. <clears throat> All right. So in addition to um, when you fired the weapon, you obtained uh, the cartridge cases for, that you fired as known uh, samples. Did you, re did you recover other items from the cartridge fired in that weapon to use for identification purposes? Yes, I also collected the bullets or projectile. How do, you, how do you do that? So we have in our laboratory, um, it's a water tank. It's just a large rectangular tank that's filled with water. Um, and so that way we are able to collect bullets um, where the water does not mark them. So I know that the markings that are again on that known standard are coming from that firearm. So when I do that microscopic comparison, I know where those marks are originating from. Now, in this case, did you, uh, did you obtain some known uh, bullets or spent round or whatever you, you, you want to call it um, that had the markings from that particular firearm? Did you obtain some known, uh, some known bullets or projectiles from that firearm? Yes, I did. So in my test firing, I collected both known standards for the cartridge cases and for the bullets. Let me make sure I got the right ones. Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been uh, perceived in evidence as Exhibit 111. First, do you, are you able to recognize it from the packaging? Yes, I recognize the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials. Again, this outer seal, which is still intact with my initials and the date. And when you receive that particular exhibit, what, in what condition was the package? It was in a sealed condition. <clears throat> when you entered into that packaging, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? With the court's permission, you can. That will assist in refreshing your recollection, you may. Yes, thank you. This packaging is one fired bullet. Okay. And can you uh, open the packaging uh, to satisfy yourself with what you recovered in there and observed?
Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials, which are scribed on this bullet. Okay. Now, um, you're describing this as a bullet, and some of us would call it a hunk of metal, okay? So how are you able to, to uh, tell us that's somehow associated with a firearm? Um, by my visual examination of, of this particular item. Okay. And what about it leads you to that conclusion? Um, so the shape of this item, um, there is also, um, we call it ghost rifling. Um, so in a barrel, there are lands and grooves. So those are raised and lowered portions. If you think to the opening of um, any James Bond movie where they kind of show you that, that look down the barrel, that's what I'm talking about, those raised and lowered portions. So those lands and grooves have a direction of twist, left or right, and that helps give stability to a bullet, sort of like when a football player throws a football, that spin that's given to it, it helps give stability to the bullet. Um, in this case, the jacket or the outer portion of this bullet is missing in areas. However, I can see indications of those raised and lowered portions, even though that outer surface of the bullet is no longer on here. Okay. Now, um, so, the, so the jury understands, um, are you looking for uh, class and individual characteristics on these items uh, as you did with the cartridge case? Yes, I am. And it... Is there anything about from the condition of that particular uh, lump of metal that you that you say is a bullet um, that tell you what caliber, like you, you can look on the head stamp or the cartridge case and you have a pretty good idea what the caliber and type of ammunition it is. Is there anything about that that tell, gives you that information? Um, there is so... Different weights of different bullets can be indicators of particular types of calibers or families of calibers. Um, in this case, um, it's similar to 38 caliber class, which does include 9 millimeter Luger. However, I was not able to, due to the damage um, and the amount missing on this, uh, on this bullet, to determine a particular caliber type. So I could not say whether or not this is a 9mm Luger specifically. However, it does fall under the same umbrella family that a 9mm Luger does. Okay. And that's uh, 38, 357, 9mm. Is that the range that that bullet falls within as far as caliber? Yeah. So there are many calibers that are encompassed in that 38 caliber class. Uh, 38 Special, 357 Magnum, 380 Auto, 9mm Luger. Um, again, are all types that, based on their weights and diameters and appearance, can fall under that same class family. All right. Is, so is that really all you can tell us based on what was left on that particular bullet left behind by the firearm? Yes, unfortunately, due to the damage, um, this bullet has actually no value for microscopic comparison purposes. So there are not those individual characteristics on here for me to be able to do a microscopic comparison. So there's no value to this, to this uh, piece of evidence. All right. So you were able to quickly get to the end of the examination of this because you never got to using the stereo microscope. That is correct. All right. Can you put that exhibit aside um, and... Tell us uh, what uh, what labeling the a agency placed with that particular exhibit. Is exhibit M D Q. Okay, I'm going to put exhibit. So that was Q. All right, and set that one aside, and we'll move on to the next one. I'm going to show you what's been received in evidence of, as Exhibit 30, and ask if you recognize um, the, from the packaging, uh, Exhibit 30 as being something that you've evaluated and examined. Yes, again, the uh, FDLE number, the exhibit number, my initials the intact seal on the outside with my initials and the date. 
And when you received that uh, package, in what condition was it in? It was in a sealed condition. When you opened that package, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? Uh, would it refresh your recollection? Yes, it would. Um, yes. Uh, in this package was one lead fragment. Okay. And could you open up the package and satisfy yourself that what you found and uh, examined from that exhibit is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated uh, FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials, which are scribed on this piece of evidence. Okay. Now, um, you describe that as a fragment. What do, you, what do you mean when you call it a fragment? Um, that is just a piece of lead. So I cannot determine there are not any distinguishing features to determine whether or not this is a projectile or a portion of a projectile. Okay. So there wasn't any any marks on it that, are, are you comfortable with uh, saying that it is a part of a projectile? No, I am not. Um, I do not know what the origin of this item is. So there is none of those um, possible ghost rifling on there. I also do not see any distinguished base or nose. Basically the indicators that I would look for for determining if something may be a projectile. Okay. So um, can you place that exhibit back in the packaging? And tell us how that particular exhibit was labeled. So this is labeled AL9. And I'm going to put up exhibit 97. Okay. So you couldn't tell us anything about that particular, that last exhibit we just talked about, right? That is correct. It was also no value for microscopic comparison purposes. I'm going to show you what's been uh, received in evidence as uh, exhibit 115. And I'd ask you looking at the outer packaging if you recognize it. I do by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer packaging seal from where I entered, which is still intact, my initials, and the date. And uh, when you entered into that package, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? Will it refresh your recollection? Yes. Yes. It was one fired bullet portion. Okay. And can you look in the package and satisfy yourself that what you examined and placed back in there is in there today in Exhibit 115? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. And, um, what is it that you have there? I mean, you talked, you told us about it. What is it that uh, Ray would call that a bullet, I believe? Yes, a fired bullet portion. Okay. And so why are you, why are you saying portion? Um, because it appears that there is some of this um, evidence or the bullet that is missing or not present. So it is not a full intact bullet. Okay. And that was um, what number or letter was associated with that particular exhibit? MD11. And that was States Exhibit 115. 
All right. What did I do with the other? Did I put them together? Okay. Okay. MDLF out on the driveway. Okay. Now, is there information that leads on that hunk of metal that leads you to conclude that it is a bullet? Yes, there is um, the appearance of this. So I do um, see a base portion or that rear portion of um, the bullet. There also appears to be that faint ghost rifling on it. Um, and just the overall appearance of this item um, does appear consistent with a fired bullet. Okay. Is there any other information that was on this particular item that helped you further identify it? No, I could not determine the caliber um, due to the damage of this item. Um, it's also no value for microscopic comparison purposes, again, due to that damage. Okay. Um, can you put the uh, item back into the packaging, Exhibit 115, and we'll move on to the next exhibit. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been received in evidence as Exhibit 88 and ask if you recognize that exhibit from the package. Yes, I do. By the exhibit number, um, FDLE number, my initials, uh, the outer seal, which is still intact with my initials and the date. And um, was the item intact before you entered into it? Yes, it was received in a sealed condition. What did you find when you opened that package? Uh, again, I would have to refer to my notes. Do you need that to refresh your recollection? Yes, I do, please. Do so. And this package was one lead fragment. Okay. Can you open up the package and satisfy yourself that what you found in there is May I further open this yes. envelope, please? Yes, if you need it to get in there, then that, yes. Yes, I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials, which are scribed on this piece of evidence. Okay. Now, what information did you obtain from that piece of evidence? Um, in this piece of evidence, I was not able to determine whether or not it was a fired ammunition component. Um, it was a lead fragment. However, it did not have any identifying features. I could not determine uh, caliber, and it also did not have um, any characteristics of value for microscopic comparison purposes. Okay. And uh, you can put that back in there and then tell us how the agent, submitting agency identified it. This was identified as Exhibit MD-16. Okay. I want to show you next uh, what is uh, Exhibit 89. I want to ask if you recognize Exhibit 89 from the outer packaging. Yes, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials. Again, the outer seal, which is still intact, um, with my initials and the date. Prior to entering the packaging, what was the condition? It was in a sealed condition. What did you find in that package when you entered <coughs> There was one possible lead bullet core fragment and one steel fragment.
Yes, I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, which is further designated A and B to distinguish these two items from one another, and my initials. Okay. And can you tell us what, um, what those items are, what they mean to you as far as uh, determining whether or not they relate to a firearm, uh, a particular class of So the possible lead um, bullet core fragment, I was not able to determine definitively whether that was a core portion of a bullet. Um, so you can think of a, a jacketed bullet, sort of like an M&M, where the candy coating is the jacket and the core is the chocolate part. Um, so in this case, there was, a, it, there was an indication that it may have been. It appeared that there was a base present. However, with how damaged and flattened this piece was, I could not say definitively whether or not it was a core from a bullet. Okay. And then the other piece um, was a magnetic fragment of steel, um, and I was not able to determine whether or not that was a uh, fired ammunition component. All right. So this is possibly a bullet, but you can't say definitively. Possibly a bullet core, but I cannot say definitively. And both of these items, again, um, are no value for microscopic comparison purposes. All right. Can you put those items back into the packaging and tell us how the agency labeled it once you, once you get everything back in there? And this was designated exhibit MD-17. Okay. Now I want to um, next deal with exhibit 18. Tell that from the packaging. Yes, from the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And um, what was the condition of the package when you uh, received it? It was received in a sealed condition. And was there uh, a package with it, a package on this particular exhibit? Um, yes, may I please refer to my notes to refresh my memory? Uh, that will refresh your memory? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, there was um, an additional package inside of that outer package. All right. Could you, and, and what did you find? I guess there's a package and then a package and then you found something. What did you ultimately find when you got uh, to the end of the package? One copper fragment. Okay. And uh, can you look inside? Is that exhibit 115 we're talking about? 118. Right. Thank you for giving us that. All right. Exhibit 118. And, and before you do that, the box, does it have any writing on it, that particular box? Yeah, so this box actually has the markings on it um, due to how small the fragment is inside of here. Um, so my abbreviated case number, exhibit number, and initials are actually written on the outer um, box here that was inside that packaging. Um, okay, and looking inside that particular box, to... May I open it? Yes. <clears throat> Need to refresh your memory again? Yes, please. My apologies. Yes, I do recognize this. Um, while the, the outer packaging is marked, I did also take photographs of this item, um, and they are consistent with those photographs and also what I remember from, from working this case. Okay. When, you, when you got to the inside the box and saw the item, what observations did you make of it? Um, so I was not able to determine whether or not this was a component of a uh, fire piece of ammunition or not, if it, if it pertained to a bullet. Um, I was unable to determine the caliber. 
Um, there was no base or rifling present, and thus it was no value for microscopic comparison purposes. Okay. And could you put the box inside the package and then tell us what's written on the package as to um, where the item came from? And it's on the other side, I believe. Yes, this is uh, designated exhibit ME1B. Okay. And when it says ME1B, when you turn it over, Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are there words that are written as to the location where that item was obtained? Yes, it says fragment from T-shirt. Does she want to can we approach? The attorneys may approach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a restroom stretch break. Um, you would just please leave your notebooks on the chairs. And again, make sure you follow my instructions during our 10 minute recess. Thank you. All right. Please be seated. We are back on the record in case number 2012 CF 55504A, State of Florida versus William Woodward. I'll note the presence of Mr. Woodward at council table with Mr. Eisenminger, Mr. Eisenminger presence of Mr. Respis and Mr. Shiner on behalf of the state. Ready to bring the jury back in and resume with the direct examination of Ms. Durfee? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, well, the state estimated about 45 more minutes for direct examination, is that correct? Right. And I don't know if the defense has any estimate of time for cross-examination. Okay, so that's about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, are you asking if we defer him until the morning or? Yeah, well, right, because, the, you know, the. Trying to tell him to keep working or stop working over there and come here is really what we're trying to. Uh... All right. May I have the attorney's approach for just a moment? All right, so we're ready to bring the witness back and bring the jury back in? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated. Jury is present in the courtroom once again, and ladies and gentlemen, during our brief recess, did you follow all of my instructions? Yes. Is anyone aware of any violations of any of my instructions? No. All right, Mr. Respis, you want Ms. Uh, Durfee back on the stand? Yes. All right, let's bring her in, please. Take the witness stand, please. You may inquire. Yes, Ms. Durfee, I wanted to move on to another exhibit. Um, exhibit uh, 112. I want to ask if you recognize uh, the exhibit from the packaging as something that you examined in this case. Yes, I do. From the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the seal on the outer packaging, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. And uh, what was the condition of the packaging when you entered into it, before you entered into it? I received it in a sealed condition. Um, what did you find in the packaging when you went into it? Do you need to refresh your memory? Or you yes, do? I do, please. Uh, okay, please refresh your recollection. Um, it is one fired bullet portion. Okay. And uh, can you look inside the package to determine if the item that you examined and uh, placed back in there is in there today? Okay. 
Yes, it is. I recognize it by both the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials that are scribed on this piece of evidence. Okay. Now, I, I think you described this as um, a bullet, a part of a bullet. How, how were you able to make that determination on this particular object? Uh, there was some rifling present on this item. Um, that is how I was able to determine that it was a fired bullet portion, as there are some um, pieces of this evidence that is not present. Okay. And um, were you able to uh, get any more information from that um, portion of a projectile other than um, it was a bullet? Uh, I was not able to determine the caliber of this. Um, however, I did a microscopic comparison with this item to the firearm um, because while I did not have all of the class characteristics present that may be in a fully intact bullet, um, the characteristics that I did have present um, did warrant an examination with the firearm. Okay. And what were the uh, results of your microscopic comparison with the um, known bullet? I was neither able to determine if it was fired from that firearm or if it was fired from a different firearm. And what does that mean? What did you find that, that, that led you to conclude that it could have, and then what was it that said it might not have? That's what I guess. Um, there was really nothing that could sway one way or the other. Um, it could not be determined either way, um, mainly due to the damage that's on this item. Uh, while there are markings on there, um, I did not see those reproducing characteristics and similarity like I saw with my known standards and thus was not able to make um, a positive or negative determination. So it could neither be determined um, if it was the firearm or if it was not the firearm. Okay. Now, are there things in, in general like are you able to tell if the um, twists are, are correct or the Land, the counts of the lands and grooves are correct, or were you unable to do that as well? Um, I was able to determine that it had a right twist, um, so the direction of that twist, a right or counterclockwise twist to it, which was similar to the firearm. Um, however, beyond that, I was not able to determine any further characteristics. Okay. So the, the only thing that you could determine, other than that there were markings consistent with being fired, was that the twist was in the right direction. That is correct. All right. Can you put that exhibit back in the packaging and um, tell us how that exhibit was labeled by law enforcement? This is exhibit MDR. Okay. Now I want to show you what's been received in evidence as exhibit Yes, I do, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, again, the outer seal, which is still intact with my initials and the date. And um, was the item sealed when you received it? Yes, it was received in a sealed condition. <clears throat> when you opened that package, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? If it will refresh your recollection. Yes. So I also received in this packaging a one fired bullet portion. Okay. And so um, that's the same description you gave the last exhibit we just talked about? That is correct. Right. Now, what about the exhibit led you to, well, you aren't looking at it yet. So let me have you go in there and see if, if the item that you examined is in there today. Yes, it is. I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. And um, what is it about that particular item that leads you to the conclusion that it's a portion of a fired bullet? Again, I do have some rifling present. However, there is quite a bit of damage um, to this. So while I do have some marks of rifling, um, not all of this bullet is present. Okay. We, so, were you able to tell the caliber of the bullet from, from the information that you had from that object? 
No, I was not. There was too much damage. Did you um, do any uh, stereoscopic or microscopic examination on that object? Yes, I did. I was able to determine that it also had right twist, so I did a microscopic comparison to the firearm. All right. And what were the results and conclusions based on the microscopic examination? That I could not determine whether it was fired from the firearm or not fired from the firearm. Okay. Now, did you get any more information off of that projectile than you did the item we just talked about previously? There did, um, there was more rifling present, so the bearing surface of this bullet did have more information. However, it was extensively damaged. So while um, there may have been more lands and groups present, um, however, it was still not able to be determined whether or not this firearm did or did not fire this projectile. All right. Did you find anything inconsistent with it being fired from the, that firearm? No, so that's basically what that um, neither nor inconclusive means, is that there was nothing um, that, you know, was inconsistent or necessary, you know, so there were some consistencies. Um, so I did not have inconsistencies in those class characters. So there was that right twist. However, beyond that, um, I did not have a level of consistency to be able to make any type of further um, conclusion other than it could not be determined. So what you're saying is, it wasn't the individual characteristics sufficient to identify it for the firearm? That is correct. There were not sufficient characteristics on here for an identification. Okay. Can you put that uh, uh, item back in the exhibit package and tell us how law enforcement described that exhibit? This was marked as exhibit MDU. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 114. Yeah. Do you recognize the exhibit from the packaging as something you examined in this case? Yes, by the FDLE case number, exhibit number of my initials, the sealed portion that's still intact on the outer um, packaging here with my initials and the date. All right. And what was the condition you did? It was received in a sealed condition. When you opened the package, what did you find inside? It was also one fired bullet portion. And um, could you open the package and satisfy yourself that what you examined is in there today? Yes, I recognize the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. And uh, you describe this, this again as a portion of a bullet or a projectile. Um, what did you have, what information did you have from that object that was uh, the same or dis different from the last two that we just talked about? Uh, so I did have a base present on this object, um, and there was some rifling present. Um, however, again, a large majority of the jacket or that bearing surface of the bullet is missing on this. Okay. And is it the outer portions of the bullet that receive the marks that you use for comparison? Is that why you need that information? Yes, that is correct. <coughs> What were you able to conclude from the information that was on the projectile um, about it? So in this case, um, because I did have that base present and was able to do a measurement, I was able to determine that this was consistent with 38 caliber class. So again, like we spoke of, it's sort of an umbrella of several different calibers, which includes 9 millimeter Luger. Um, however, I was not able to make any further determination on caliber beyond that. Um, it did also have a right twist, so a comparison was done with the firearm. Okay. And what were the results of your microscopic analysis? Uh, that again, I was neither able to determine if it was from that firearm or from a different firearm. Okay. So again, the class characteristics were the same, but there wasn't individual characteristics to say it came from that firearm? 
That's correct. So the observable class characteristics were the same. Again, there is a large portion of this jacket that is missing. Um, so while there was some rifling present and that was in a right twist, um, I was not able to make any further determination just based on how damaged uh, this evidence was. Okay. Can you put that exhibit back into the packaging and tell us how law enforcement described that uh, proje particular projectile? This was designated exhibit MDV. Okay. And then I want to show you what's been marked as exhibit uh, 119. Yes, I do. From the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials. Uh, again, the seal on the outer packaging, which is still intact with my initials and the date. Okay. And is, again, is that a package that has a container within it or another package? Yes, it does. <coughs> and um, do you recall it after you uh, went into the packages, what you found ultimately inside? Uh, may I refer to my notes, please? Will it refresh your recollection? Yes, it will. Yes. Thank you. So in this outer brown package bag inside, there was also a white box um, that was also sealed. In that box was a one fired bullet portion. Okay. And so you're describing that the same way that you've described. Uh, you are... U and V that we talked about earlier, which were the last, last group of exhibits? Yes, that is correct. And could you open up the packaging? I think you're going to have to open the container inside the, uh, inside the exhibit and satisfy yourself that the item that you examined is in there today. Yes, yeah, so again on this um, inner white box, I do have the abbreviated case number as well as the exhibit number and my initials. And I recognize the abbreviated case number, the exhibit number, and my initials that are scribed on this evidence itself. Okay. Now, what uh, you call this a portion of a bullet or a projectile. Um, what information did that object have that you were able to observe? Uh, again, this did have a base to it um, and some faint rifling, which let me know that it was a fire projectile. Um, however, like the other cases um, or the other evidence in this um, that we've talked about, there was a large majority of the jacket that was missing, so that bearing surface. Okay. So you can tell us that that is a uh, projectile, a bullet? That is correct. Can you tell us uh, general class caliber information about that bullet or not? Is there enough information for that? Yes, yeah, so I was able to determine um, that it is consistent with 38 caliber class um, and that it also had a right twist. Okay. And um, was there sufficient individual characteristics to say it was fired from that particular firearm that you, that you used to get the known samples from? Uh, no, I was neither able to determine if it was fired from the firearm or not fired from the firearm. Okay. And uh, on the package, not, I guess, um, that we started with. How was that exhibit described and where does it indicate it was recovered from? It exhibit ME6B and it is uh, labeled as projectile from upper chest. Okay, and I want to start with Exhibit uh, 31 now. And, uh, 
Yes, I recognize the FDLE case number, exhibit number, my initials, the outer seal, which is still intact with my initials and the date. Okay. And uh, was the item sealed when you received it? Yes, it was. When you entered into the packaging, what did you find in, the, in that particular exhibit? May I please refer to my notes? Will it refresh your memory? Yes. Um, this is listed as, um, um, my apologies, I had uh, one fired bullet. Okay. And <coughs> so, didn't say a portion of a bullet, and you called it a bullet. That is correct. All right. So, can you look into the packaging and determine if the item that, that you uh, analyzed uh, is in the package? So I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. So that's the item that you examined. And, and what was it described as by law enforcement? Uh, a projectile. On the package. On the package. What, what exhibit number? I'm sorry. Oh, my apologies. Uh, AL8. Okay. <coughs> so... Um, Looking at that uh, particular exhibit, what information were you able to obtain uh, when you examined it? Uh, so this is a fully intact bullet. Um, so I was able to determine that it had six lands and grooves with a right twist, which is the same class characteristic as the submitted firearm. AL8. Right. Now, we're talking about the covering, like an M&M. Yes. Is that visible in, on, the, on the view screen, what it is you're referring to? Yes, it is. So this entire copper-colored portion is the jacket. And actually, if you flipped that bullet um, so that that skinny side is down, this portion right here that looks silvery, um, that's the exposed core. So that's the inside of that bullet. So when you were talking about not having the jacket on some of these, what you called part, partial uh, projectiles, is that what you were referring to, that you're not having the, the coppery part? Yes, that that outer part was not present. Okay. Now, was this bullet more suitable for comparison purposes than the other ones that we've been talking about? One group where you said, I can maybe tell it's a bullet, some of them I can't, and the others where you say, tell it's a fire projectile, but I can't identify the firearm. Did you get some more information off of this exhibit? Yes, I was able to. Back in the package now. And can you tell us what information you, you obtained from this uh, particular bullet when you looked at it under the uh, mic microscopically? Sure. So similar to with the cartridge cases, how I looked at my fired cartridge cases of my known standard, I did the same with the bullets. So I'm looking at the microscopic striation. So as the bullet is going down the barrel of the firearm, it's picking up these little burrs and marks that are on that barrel, um, incidental to the manufacture process and also the use and abuse of that firearm. 
So it's imparting those individual characteristics now on that bearing surface of the bullet. So when I look at my known standards to one another, I can see what on that bullet is reproducing. I'm then going to introduce an unknown to see if I see similar reproducing marks, where in this case I did. Okay. And what did you find that, uh, that caused you to reach a, your ultimate opinion or conclusion? What did you find? Uh, so I did find that this um, bullet was identified as having been fired from this firearm uh, due to the correspondence of individual characteristics observed microscopically. Okay. So uh, you're finding things that were unique to that firearm on that projectile? That is correct. Can you put that exhibit aside and we'll talk about the next one? I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 32. You recognize that exhibit? Yes, by the FDLE exhibit number, um, item number, or my apologies, um, the FDLE case number, the exhibit number, my initials, the seal on the side, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. When you received that item, what condition was it in? It was in a sealed condition. When you looked in that exhibit, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? Will it refresh your memory? Yes, it will. Okay. Thank you. So this also contained one fired bullet. And um, so you didn't talk about a portion of a bullet, you talked about the whole thing? That is correct. Right. Is, was it in a similar con condition to what the law enforcement called AL-8, the bullet we just looked at? Uh, may I observe it, please? Oh, uh, yeah. Why don't you look in there and see if the same item's in there first. <laughs> I guess that's the first step, then we'll start talking about it. Yes, again, I recognize it by the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials. Okay. Now, uh, I guess my question was, was that uh, projectile or bullet uh, similar in appearance to the bullet, the AL-8 that I just put up on the view screen with the last exhibit? It is similar in that that jacketing is intact. However, while that bullet was rounder, um, this bullet actually has some flattening and some damage to it. Okay. And let me, let me put this up on the view screen so you show the jury and explain that. And that's exhibit. Uh, this is exhibit AL10. I'll put the bag over here with it. Okay. And so we looked at the the projectile. I guess it was AL8 was what law enforcement called it. And this one is how is it kind of pinched at the back? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, so it does have some damage, but again, um, the entirety of the bullet is present. All right. And were you able to obtain information off of the projectile that you could ex uh, examine? Yeah, so again, it um, was a six lands and grooves with a right twist, which was similar in class, char or same class characteristic as the firearm. So then I performed a microscopic comparison. Okay. And what were the results of the microscopic comparison? But I was also able to determine that it was fired from the um, exhibit CHD um, firearm. All right. The firearm that we kind of started your testimony out with is sitting in the box next to you, right? Yes. States exhibit 128. Okay. I'm going to keep that one over here. Then I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 87. Yes, I recognize it by the FDLE case number, exhibit number, and my initials on the outer packaging, 
as well as the seal on the outer packaging that's still intact with my initials and the date. And what did you find in that exhibit when you, when you entered it? May I refer to my notes, please? Yes. Assuming you can't remember, you need to be reminded. Yes, please. Uh, so in this package um, uh, was one fired bullet jacket portion. Okay. So that's different from the last two that we talked about. Right? That is correct. All right, what's the difference? So in this one, all I have is the jacket portion present. So that middle or core portion was not present with this. Okay. And is that something you can use to for analysis purposes? Yes, I can. And can you open the, well, before you open it, was it, what was the condition of the package when you received it? It was re received in a sealed condition. And what, um, how did law enforcement describe that particular exhibit? This was exhibit MD7. Correct. Okay. Can you open the package and satisfy yourself that what you examined is in the package today? Yes, so I recognize the abbreviated FTLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials, which are scribed on this piece of evidence. And so the jury can appreciate the difference from the other two. You bring the So again, we're looking at just the jacket portion of a bullet. So this is just that outer portion. So the core or middle portion is no longer present. All right. And what are you looking for on this jacket? It looks like there's a tear in it as well. How are you able to, to use that for comparison purposes? There is a tear on it, however, that's not, in this case, affecting the marks that are on there. Um, so while there is some damage present, there is still individual characteristics present on this exhibit. And were you able to uh, look at general class characteristics as, a, as well as microscopic characteristics on this exhibit? Yes, I was. So it did have six lands and grooves with a right twist. And again, the individual characteristics um, to be able to microscopically compare this item. All right. So what were the results of your comparison of this uh, jacket with the known samples that you obtained from the firearm that's sitting up there next to you? Uh, that it was fired from the submitted firearm. This was described by law enforcement. I'm going to let you do it. As Exhibit MD7. All right. I want to talk about um, Exhibit 120. Yes, I do. By the FDA Lee case number, exhibit number, my initials, uh, the outer seal, which is still intact, with my initials and the date. All right. And was the item in a seal condition when you received it? Yes, it was. And was that, again, a package within a package? Yes, it was. When you ultimately went into the package, both packages, what did you find? May I refer to my notes, please? Do you need to refresh your memory? Yes, please. Yes. So
So this exhibit uh, had a sealed white box also in this brown paper bag. Um, in that box contained one fired bullet and one copper fragment. Okay. And um, so you have a fired bullet and a fragment. Can you, can you look inside the exhibit and determine whether or not the items that you uh, observed and uh, analyzed are in there today? Yes, yeah, so on this sealed white box um, also has an abbreviated case number, the exhibit number and my initials on it. And then the items in here were also further designated as one and two. Um, item one is the fired bullet, um, which I do have the abbreviated FDLE case number, the exhibit number and my initials. Uh, the other item is the fragment, um, and that just has a number two on it due to its small size. Okay, so th those are the um, items. D does the information on the packaging indicate where those items were obtained or where they were recovered? Um, it states that this is exhibit ME5B and that is projectile and fragment from neck. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the fragment first. Were you able to obtain any information uh, concerning the fragment that was recovered uh, from Mr. Hembree's body? No, I was not. There was no base or rifling present on that fragment. Um, the caliber could not be determined, and it was no value for microscopic comparison purposes. Okay. Now let's talk about, there's, there's another uh, part in there that you described as a bullet. And, uh, how much information were you able to gather off of that that would have been projectile? So on my initial examination, there is some of that jacket portion that is missing on this bullet. Um, however, uh, a large majority of the top portion of that jacket is present. Um, so I was able to determine that it was a right twist. However, upon my initial examination, I could not determine the full amount of lands and grooves uh, on this bullet. Okay. And um, what conclusions did you reach as to I was able to identify it as having been fired from the submitted firearm. you were looking at to get the information you needed for your comparison? So you can see here, so we do have that kind of shiny copper portion, so that's the jacket. And then here you can see there's actually an exposed core. So the jacket is missing in areas. However, it's a little difficult to see from here, but this top portion here does have rifling present on it. Okay. And was there su sufficient information in that portion, let me turn it over. Could you use both sides of it? Yes, I would look at its entirety. Okay. So you use the, the entire face of the of the copper portion to for your comparison. That is correct. And was there enough enough information for you to reach an opinion or a conclusion about whether or not that projectile came out of the barrel? of that uh, gun that's sitting to your left. Yes, I was able to identify it. All right, and so it's your opinion that what, where did that projectile, where was that fired from? It is my opinion that it was fired from this submitted firearm. <coughs>
Um, from, from this case, were there four different projectiles or portions of projectiles that you found came from this firearm? Yes, there was. And those were the last four things you just talked about? That is correct. Can you go through the exhibit numbers of, of the ones that, in your opinion, were fired from that firearm? Yes, yeah, so this is Agency Exhibit AL8, which is State's Exhibit 31. Agency Exhibit MD7, which is State's Exhibit 87. <coughs> Agency Exhibit AL10, which is State's Exhibit 32. And the uh, agency exhibit ME5B1, which is included in the packaging of State's Exhibit 120. I don't have any other questions in this case. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wanted to start with just a little bit about your occupation. Now, you work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. That is correct. That is a state agency, is that, that correct? That is correct. Uh, all 42 cases that you testified in were on behalf of the state of Florida, is that right? That is correct. Uh, you're actually not available for outside hire. You only work on state cases. That is correct. Um, and now what you said at the beginning of your examination of CHD, the firearm in this case, would be to test fire the firearm. Is that right? Yes. You actually test fired it uh, multiple times. Yes. And you developed two uh, both projectiles and casings that you used for comparison. Is that right? Yes. Both projectiles and cartridge cases were retained in this case. Okay. So that's T1 and T2 as we go forward. Is that right? Um, may I refresh you may. notes? Thank you. Um, I actually test fired this firearm three times. Um, so there would be test fire one, test fire two, and test fire three. So that'd be T1, T2, T3? That is correct. Okay. Um, T2... Uh, is it was a different uh, bullet manufacturer than all of the other ammunition that you looked at in this case. Is that right? That is correct. PMC. Yes. What is PMC? It's uh, a name brand. Name brand. Yes. Okay. Now the Beretta nine millimeter is not an uncommon weapon. Is that fair? That is correct. It's fairly reliable nine millimeter gun. Um, yes, I yes I would consider it that. And when you're doing these comparisons, um, you're looking for matches, is that right, primarily? Um, not necessarily. Um, so when I'm looking at my comparison to my known standard, I am looking to see what is reproducing. However, when I introduce the unknown, I am looking to see what is looking similar and if there are any dissimilarities. So I'm not necessarily, my goal isn't identification because there can be cases where it's an elimination. In talking about the... Well, you say there could be cases where it's an elimination, meaning there's a case where you've been asked to eliminate or where you ultimately eliminate? Where I ultimately eliminated. Uh, you said that in, in talking about the, the casing and the comparison for the casing, uh, your comparisons were based on the firing <coughs> pin impression. Is that right? My identification was based on the firing pin, correct. <laughs> right. Not the breach, not the return to the slide, the other portion of the firing mechanism that you described? No, while that area is observed during my examination, this identification was specifically made on the firing pin impression. Okay. And the firing pin in this case, it hit the uh, primer each and every casing that you observed. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And it made almost a perfect circular indentation? Yes, it did. Okay. So when you're doing these comparisons, uh, your microscope shows you both side by side. Is that right? 
That is correct. So I can isolate. Um, so I do have a toggle switch that's underneath those eyepieces that I'm looking at. So I can isolate one side of the microscope to the other, or I can put those items next to each other or on top of each other and move that hairline to view those items at the same time as well. And in this case, you did primarily side-by-side -side comparisons. Yes, right? that is correct. Okay. It's similar to those magazine games where you have two pictures and you have to look for similarities or differences in the two of them, right? Yes, it can be said of that. So it is pattern matching. So I'm looking at the pattern or the reproducing marks that are on this item to see what is similar or if there's something dissimilar. Okay, I'm gonna turn to then some of the casings uh, that you looked at. Um, Let's talk about state's evidence uh, 55, which was law enforcement MDE. You have your recollection of MDE. Yes, I do. So in MDE, you were able to compare that to T2 of your test firing. Is that right? That is correct. And you called that a match to T2. That is correct. Turning next to states number 56, which is MDF, which should be on the same page of your notes, that you also matched MDF to T2. That is correct. Turning to states 57, which is MDG. Now at this point, you start matching MDG to previously unknown shell casings. Is that correct? So you actually match MDG to MDE. That is correct. So you've stopped using the known comparison and starting to use one that you've previously called as a match. Not necessarily. Um, so I'm also using what's called the associative property. So the associative property is if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So in this case, I identified some of the cartridge cases directly to the firearm, and some of the cartridge cases were identified to cartridge cases that were identified directly to the firearm. Thus, they were all fired in the same firearm. You would certainly agree, though, that that chain that you've created is only as strong as its weakest link. Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, because when an identification is made, that is a determination. Um, so it doesn't weaken it because I'm identifying one thing to something else that was identified because that's still an identification. Well, let's talk about that. You have to assume that your first identification is correct. Yes. If your first identification is incorrect, then comparing things to an incorrect identification is not a strong chain. Um, that is assuming if an incorrect identification is made, which I do not believe I did. Turning to number 58, MDH. Uh, MDH you compared to MDF. That is correct, using the same principle. Turning to number 59, MDI. You compared MDI to MDP. That is correct, using the same principle. Turning to number 61, MDK. Now you compared MDK to T1 out of your test shells. That is correct. So that was one of the test fires from the firearm. And that is one of two comparisons that you made to T1. Is that right? I believe the other one being MDO. That is correct. The remaining shells you in fact compared to T2 again. That is correct. I next want to speak with you about some of the bullets and projectiles that you examined. 
the uh, state's number 30 in evidence, AL9, uh, you were saying that that lead fragment could not even be identified as a projectile. AL9? AL9, yes. No. Uh, that is correct. It was no value for microscopic comparison purposes. And for class characteristics. That is correct. Well. It's a piece of lead as far as you're concerned. That is correct. Okay. Number uh, 115, MD11, if that was the next item that the state went through with you, that fire bullet portion. You couldn't determine the caliber by looking at the bullet. That is correct. That could not be determined. Number 88, MD16, again, that's a lead fragment with no value for comparison. Is that right? That is correct. And so, as far as you're concerned, that's a piece of lead. That is correct. Skipping ahead to 114, MDV. Actually, I'm sorry, let's go back to 112, MDR. We'll go through R, U, and V. So, in MDR, you had no caliber. Uh, and simply a right twist. That is correct. Class characters is. Certainly a Beretta isn't the only firearm that makes a right twist on a projectile. No, it is not. There's plenty more that would. Yes, there are. Okay. Um, and so when you say you can't exclude it or include it, that's saying it's inconclusive. That is correct. Uh, turning to MDU which is number 113 in evidence. Uh, same idea there. You only saw the right twist. Yes, correct. Same determination that it was inconclusive. Inconclusive. Number 114, MDV. Now, with MDV, you're able to determine that it's a 38 class bullet from the diameter of the bullet. Is that right? Correct. Um, and it also has a right twist. That is correct. But it's inconclusive for comparison purposes. Correct. Inconclusive. Number 119, uh, ME6B. Now again, that is, you're determining to be a 38 class caliber bullet. That is correct with no um, further conclusive determination. So it was also inconclusive. And you did that, the class comparison of the 38 class caliber from the diameter of the bullet. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Uh, talking about uh, number 31, uh, AL8, the intact bullet. Now you matched AL8 to T1, your test fire projectile one. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, and it had the class characteristics of six lands and grooves and a right twist. Yes, that is correct. The caliber you actually determined from the match this time, not from the diameter. Is that right? Uh, the conclusive caliber, yes. Um, so while I did, when I do my initial examination, um, I am going to mark, so those class characteristics, um, the six right, I also weighed and measured that item. Um, and then did the comparison to the firearm. Um, based on that identification, um, it was determined that it was also 9 millimeter Luger. But you don't note any mm -hmm. diameter testing of AL8 in your bench notes, just that it was based on the comparison to the firearm. Um, the there cap. is in my notes um, a weight and a diameter that were measured. However, the determination of caliber, yes, was based on the identification. Okay. Now, from Number 32, law enforcement AL-10. Uh, here again, you match to T1 from your test fire ammunition. Is that right? That is correct. It has the class characteristics of six lands and grooves and a right twist. That is correct. And it, again, um, ultimately your determination as to the caliber comes from that match that you call. That is correct. Talking about number 87, which is MD7 in evidence. Now, MD7 
you match to AL-8. Yes, which was previously identified to the firearm. Which is, again, talking about that same idea. You're assuming that your match of AL-8 is correct, and then future matches would also be attributed to the firearm. Yes, I am confident in that original identification, and then use the associated property for further uh, comparisons. Certainly agree, you could compare it to T1. It was compared to T1, um, however, there were some areas of damage and just those identifying features on um, that identification was just made to the AL-8. So T1 didn't allow you to call a match, is that what you're saying? So you had to move on to AL-8? Um, yeah, so that inner comparison um, is done at times, especially if some of the marks may be um, a little more prominent, a little sharper between two items. Since that identification was already made between AL-8 and the firearm, that association was already made, so that I could do an examination then to that exhibit as also a representative as having been fired from that firearm. Well, T1 was fired into this test tank that you described, the water tank. Is that, that is right? correct. So there wouldn't be any damage to the bullet um, as it passes through the water the way that it would through other mediums, is that right? That's correct. So the, the best sample of the rifling marks is your test uh, bullet? Uh, not always. Um, sometimes that can be the most pristine condition. Um, however, those markings and that pattern that I'm looking at um, were present on all of these, which is how I was able to make those identifications. Finally, turning to number 120, which is ME5B1. 5B1 had that same right twist, is that right? That is correct. Um, and then you compared that back again to AL8. Yes, I did. Now what you did not do in this case is take another 9mm Beretta and test fire that gun. Uh, no, I did not. So you don't, FDLE doesn't have, for instance, manufacturer known samples for a 9mm Beretta? Uh, we do. However, in this case, um, the comparisons that I made with the similarities that I saw were um, of the same of the similarities that I've seen in other firearms that I've examined that are from the same firearm. Um, so it's not necessary to look at another Beretta um, because I've looked at thousands of other firearms and uh, components from those firearms, so I know what a match looks like. And so when I'm doing these comparisons, basically I'm making sure that I meet that threshold of what my own personal database of seeing all of these knowns look like, and these items didn't meet that threshold. Well, 9mm Brettas are manufactured to function, yes? I mean, the manufacturer doesn't spit them out with the idea that they're not going to operate as a firearm. That's correct. They're designed to be an operating firearm. They're designed in such a fashion where a uh, firing pin hits the uh, cylinder in the casing and ignites the powder. Yes, yeah, so it hits that primer of the cartridge case, ignites the powder, which then sends the bullet or projectile out the barrel of the firearm. And, and as you said, this particular firearm, one of the class characteristics, characteristics excuse me, uh, is the round firing pin imprint. Um, in this particular firearm, yes. As opposed to a square or some other shape. That is correct. Um, so you're operating on the belief that the microscopic comparisons from this firing pin would be different than every other 9mm Beretta that was manufactured at around that same date and time. Yes, that's correct. Moment to confer with co-counsel? You may. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? All right. Let me start with how you're able to make that conclusion and exclude all of the Berettas that were on the same line that were being manufactured when that one was being manufactured? Uh, so this is what the science of firearms identification is based on. Um, there's over 150 years of research, including what are called consecutively manufactured studies. So in those studies, um, 
samples that are given to us from manufacturers of firearms that have been made one right after each other are looked at. So it can be assumed that if two items were to share similar identifying features, they would be ones that were made one right after each other. Um, and time again, it has been proven that those firearms um, can still be identified to a single source. Um, so that's what this is based off of. So um, you have different components of these firearms. So yes, you do have the firing pin. So the actual metal that is making up that firing pin may have inconsistencies on it. Um, the actual making of that firing pin might have some inconsistencies. Then as that firearm is being used, you might get little more inconsistencies on there. So those are all those little individual characteristics that are going to be on that firearm that make it unique to that firearm. Okay. Now, um, I want to talk about uh, your, um, yourself. Is there a way that you were tested or uh, proficiency tests were done, are done on your work to make sure that you're able to do your job? Uh, so every year I am proficiency tested by an outside source um, where we receive a test in the laboratory, independently work on it, and then send those results into an independent um, Entity, CTS, Collaborative Testing Systems, I believe the acronym stands for. Um, I have passed all of my proficiency tests that I have um, partaken in since my um, employment with my current position. Um, each case is also um, reviewed um, to, to also make sure that, you know, those policies and that science is maintained um, through working this case. All right. And I guess that falls into my... done on each individual case. Is, is there uh, quality controls about how uh, people that do what you do do their work and make sure that it's accurate? Yes, there is. So we have standard operating procedures that we follow um, that include that review of every single case file that goes um, prior to going out of the laboratory. Okay. Now, I think there was some uh, mentioned this, so I just wanted to clarify. Does it matter who uh, manufactured the cartridge that you're using parts of, in this case a cartridge case and a projectile or bullet, to do your comparisons? Does it matter for purposes of your comparison which manufacturer person or which group manufactured the cartridge? Uh, no, it does not. Recross? Yes, sir. Pam, could you just name some of those studies on serial firearm testing? Uh, yes, there is the Glock um, Miami barrel study. There's also the Bauer study. Um, there's um, my apologies of thinking of these off the top of my head. I can certainly get um, a full list for you if you would like. Um, so there's also a Ruger study of slides, so that's that portion of the breech face portion. You said the first one is the Block Miami Barrel? Glock, Glock, G -L -O -C -K. Sorry, Glock. Manufacturer. Yes. Uh, Miami Barrel Study. Yes. The second one was what barrel study? I'm sorry. Bauer. Bauer. B-A-U-E-R. And the last one was a Ruger. And then Ruger, R-U-G-E-R. -E okay, and those are all... Firearm manufacturers, are they not? That is correct. And Beretta would be a firearm manufacturer. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the state? Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. You may step down. May I have the attorney's approach, please? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a brief restroom stretch break. If you would leave your notebooks on your chairs, and then we'll bring you back in as soon as possible. Please make sure that you follow all of my instructions during our brief recess. Thank you. Please be seated. The jury is present in the courtroom once again. And ladies and gentlemen, did you all follow my instructions during our last brief recess? Yes. Is anyone aware of any violations of any of my instructions? No. State may call its next witness.
Good afternoon, sir. You can please step to the podium and please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes, I do. Please have a seat over here on the witness stand. If you would please state your full name. My first name oh, is very loud. Uh, my first name is Krzysztof. It spells K R Z Y S Z T O F. Last name Podjaski. P O D J A S K I. Thank you. You may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, what do you do for work? Excuse me. What do you do for work? I'm associate medical examiner. I work for District 18, located in Rutledge, Brevard County. And how long have you been doing that kind of work? Uh, this is my 10th year here. In Brevard County? Yes. Do you do that anywhere else? Yes. I work for several years in Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or GBI, in Atlanta. Then I moved to Florida, and I worked for District 5, which is located in Lake County, in Leesburg. And what are your duties at the medical examiner's office as an associate medical examiner? My duty is to uh, determine the cause and manner of death. Okay. Uh, sir, are you a doctor? Yes, I am. And can you please uh, tell the members of the jury your training and experience that allows you to do the job that you do? I finished medical school back in Poland, where I practiced for multiple years, uh, orthopedics and trauma surgery. Moved to the United States. I finished two residency programs in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, anatomic uh, pathology and clinical pathology. I finished one year fellowship in surgical pathology, also in Hartford Hospital. Then I finished one year in uh, fellowship in forensic pathology in Fulton County, Atlanta, Georgia. I'm board certified in anatomic pathology. I'm board certified in forensic pathology. I'm a member of, uh, for example, um, American Academy of Forensic Scientists. I'm also a member of Florida Association of Medical Examiners, etc. Okay. And have you had an occasion in your in your career, your professional career, to testify as to the cause and manner of death? Yes. And approximately, so, yeah. approximately how many times? How many times? How many times? To testify? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't recall the number, but over a hundred. Okay. And you've done that here in Florida. In Georgia, Florida, and Poland, yes. And you are a medical doctor? Yes, and I can prescribe medications. You, you have a license to do that? Yes, I have you, a license. Your patients typically don't need prescriptions, though, is that true? Uh, but I need. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'm going to turn your attention to an investigation that involved the deaths of uh, Roger Picor, or Peacher, um, and a Gary Hembry. And I want to start with a, the death investigation of Roger Peacher or PCOR. Um, did you perform, were you associated with that? Yes. Okay. And you were the medical examiner? Yes. And was a body presented to you? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you, we're going to put it on the screen here, what the evidence is. <clears throat> you recognize the, what's depicted in States 116? Yes. Okay, and how is it that you recognize that? Uh, this is our ID picture, and it shows a very specific number, and then any piece of evidence would have exact same number. Okay. Would be followed by that number. So that's the 12487? Yes. So that, that particular number is associated with this particular individual? With this, yes, particular individual. When, yes. You, when you received this case involving this particular individual, um, how did you receive the body? Uh, the body, in any case of homicides, always comes to our office in a black body bag, which is sealed. And I'm the one who actually opens that seal. And we photograph uh, before I open, you know, cut the seal, and then we photograph the seal. Okay. And did this particular individual come in that manner? Yes. Okay. And did you cut the seal? Yes, I did. Uh, please tell the members of the jury the first thing that you do 
in any autopsy case? Well, in case of homicide, I obviously cut the seal. I look at the body, the way it's received in our office. Body is uh, mostly, well, most of the cases, clotted. Uh, we take multiple pictures, the way body is received, with blood, with clotted, and so and so. Then we undress the body. We take another, uh, a lot of pictures of, of the body. Uh, we wash the body. We take another series of the body, if needed. In the, any case of uh, homicide, when uh, we are dealing with stab wounds or gunshot wounds, we perform multiple X-ray examination, which I did on both of those cases. Then I open body. We call it Y-shaped incision. I remove all internal organs. I uh, trying to figure out actually what's going on and uh, trying to figure out if there's any evidence of natural disease, for example, hypertrophic heart disease, pneumonia, and so and so. But also, I, uh, during autopsy, uh, I follow the wound tracks, I describe injuries, I measure blood, if there is blood in any of the chest cavities or abdominal cavities. I removed all organs. I uh, save samples of each internal organ. We fix it informally, and, and if it's needed, we will send it to the outside lab, and they would stain that for us. And then I will use a microscope to look at those slides. That's basically what. So, so that's an overview what of an, we, an, what we do. And then, obviously, uh, I have to conclude, and I have to decide about the manner and the cause of that. Very good. So when Mr. Peacher came to you, or 12487 came to you, and you did an external examination of him, um, did you notice any injuries that were apparent to you? Yes. Okay, and please tell the members of the jury what injuries that you noticed that were apparent to you. Got some points. Okay, and where were they at? Uh, do you want me what, to just generally, describe? Generally. In the head area. Uh, any other gunshot wounds that were visible on his body? No. Uh, any other abrasions, contusions, bruises, anything of that nature? No. Okay. Uh, we, you told the members of the jury that there was a series of photographs that would be taken when you receive the body, when the body is clothed, prior to the body being cleaned, and then after being cleaned. Did we, you selected some photographs that you believe would be helpful for this jury in understanding the cause and manner of death? Yes. Okay. Can I approach the witness, Judge? You may. FC and FD, and ask if you recognize the scenes depicted in those photographs. Yes. And how do you recognize those photographs? Well, they were taken during our autopsy, and they had that very specific number that I mentioned before. Your Honor, at this time, I'll offer those as next number exhibits. Any objection? No objection. Without objection, that will be. 148, 149, and 150. Doctor, I believe there's a laser pointer there in front of you. Yes. The button closest to the end has uh, is the for the laser. Could you identify or can you see on this particular picture, I know it's a little washed out, any of the injuries that you would have noted or the gunshot wounds you were speaking of? This is gunshot wound right here. This is the entrance gunshot wound. Okay. And were you able to track that gunshot wound's path through Mr. Peacher's body, face or head? Yes. Can you tell the members of the jury where that, that wound led to? Uh, the wound went through the skin, obviously subcutaneous tissues and muscles of the, we call that area, right infraorbital area through the right maxillary sinus, causing uh, fractures, uh, through the maxilla, which is that part of the skull, causing no, fractures. You're, you're opposed? Yes. To your upper jaw or cheek area? Zygomatic region, uh, causing fracture. And those are very specific anatomic uh, descriptions, uh, but to the petrous part of the left temporal bone and through the left external auditory meatus to the left ear. I'm going to show you states evidence 184. What are we looking at in 184? 
right here is exit associated. Sorry, 184. 184. Did I not? <laughs> right here is exit associated with dust guard shuttle. So, and how, tell the members of the jury how you differentiate between an entrance and an exit. Uh, we are extremely well trained, and it depends on what part of the body the entrance can look differently. Usually, uh, entrance is very circular or oval and has what we call marginal rim of abrasion. There is a piece of skin that is missing. When bullet exits, there is no piece of actually skin missing, and those gunshot wounds can be very irregular, slit-like. Each gunshot wound looks different, and it depends on what area of the body we are talking about. So in this particular case, when we're looking at states 148, you were able to track the path of that injury from the previous exhibit, from his cheekbone, from 116 to 148. Yes, and on many occasions, we use a Probes. We actually can probe the wound truck. Okay. Uh, Mr. You noticed there was a. Were there any other gunshot wounds on Mr. Peacher? Any other? Yes. Yes. Okay. And where was the other one located? It was located in the what we call parietal region, that part of the skull. Okay. I'm going to show you stage 149. And what are we? Looking at there, we see an uh, entrance of second gunshot wound. As I described before, it's very rounded. There's this piece of skin missing in the middle, so I have no doubt that this is the entrance wound. Okay. And looking at, at any of these uh, gunshot wounds that we've looked at, whether it was one, the one <coughs> 116 as an entrance or in 149 as an entrance, are you able to determine the, the distance? Nope. When we're talking about distance, how far away the, the firearm was from the body? No. Nope. Okay. And were you able to track the injury or the gunshot wound that was located in States 149 to where it went? In this case? Yes, uh, sir. The gunshot wound number two, yes. It went through the uh, scalp in the right parietal region, right parietal bone, right parietal lobe, and those are parts of brain, corpus callosum, once again, parts of brain left temporal lobe, and left temporal bone. Okay. And obviously strike, uh, a projectile striking the brain would do what? What would that do to, to someone to be struck with a projectile in the brain? Uh, I'm sorry, can you? Well, so something just traveled through this man's brain. Yeah. What would that do to him and his ability to function? Absolutely, well, uh, multiple uh, skull fractures. I already described the fractures of maxilla and uh, fractures of the front end uh, of, of his uh, skull. But that one particular caused fractures involving temporal bones, those two bones on the side of our head, parietal bones, those two bones here, diastatic occipital bone, which means that it wasn't really fracture. Our bones so connected by sutures, and those sutures separated. So we call it the aesthetic fracture. And obviously associated with both gunshot wounds were uh, severe brain injuries and the hemorrhage. Okay. And were you, you were able to track that to an entrance or an exit? Yes. And where was the exit? The exit was in the left temporal bone. Okay. I'm showing you stage 150. So this is the exit wound of gunshot wound number two. Did you also conduct any, you were discussing outside lab and fluid. Did you collect any fluid for testing at outside labs? During every autopsy, we collect body fluids, regardless if we are dealing with uh, natural death, uh, accidental, or homicidal, or suicidal. We collect fluid from the middle of the eye. We call it vitreous fluid. We collect blood, urine, bile, and we keep stomach contents. And on every single case, we send everything ex with the exception of uh, gastric contents uh, to the outside lab for toxicology. Okay. And were you able to receive toxicology reports in this particular case? Yes. And did you utilize those reports in, in this autopsy? Yes. And 
Were you able to note any substances like alcohol in Mr. Peacher's system? Uh, he had level of uh, 0 0.09, which is slightly above the legal level, actually uh, 0 0.093. Okay. And any other uh, medications, controlled substances on board? Uh, we found evidence that he was smoking marijuana. In Mr. Peacher's case? Yes. Okay. Good. And we found duck, uh, I'm sorry, drug, uh, propofol. Propofol is drug that is used to induce a surgery. They give it to the patient before surgery to relax the patient and to induce sleep. Okay. And Mr. This particular autopsy, 12487, Mr. Peacher, he didn't come to you from the field, though, did he? Where did he come from? I have no idea. Was there signs of medical intervention in his case? Uh, we are trying to uh, always test the anti-mortem blood. It means before the people get in the hospital many uh, medications. But it's, I believe it's possible. Uh, do you, okay, all right, very good. Having conducted the autopsy on Mr. Peacher, do you have an opinion as to the cause and manner of death? Uh, the cause of death, I call it a gunshot wound of head, and the manner was called homicide. In each of the, the gunshot wounds, the entry wounds, can you explain to the members of the jury why it is that you wouldn't be able to tell distance of those shots? Okay, every time bullet exits barrel, there is jet of flame, there is carbon burn and unburned particles of uh, uh, powder and so and so. Uh, if uh, the barrel's close enough, let's say up to 12 inches, it depends on the bullet and the gun and so and so you would see a little bit of soot, which is carbon, it's like black powder. Then if you move far, but further, you would see stippling. Stippling are little burns and abrasions that are caused by, once again, burn and unburned particles of powder. And it looks like a funnel. The, far, the further you go from the, uh, let's say that person, the funnel is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and they all disappear. We, we don't see a stippling. Every time I see a stippling, I uh, tell me that, well, that was fired most likely closer than three feet. So I would call it um, indeterminate. But in this case, I couldn't tell uh, how far was barrel from the target. I didn't find suit. I didn't find stippling. So I had to call it indeterminate, which simply means I don't know how far was the shooter. Were you also involved in the autopsy of a Gary Hembry? Yes. I'll just show you what's in evidence as states one. Do you recognize the person depicted in state one seventeen? Yes. Okay. And how do you recognize 117? Well, it has that very specific number here. Number is uh, 8, no, 484. 12-484. And in 2012, did you perform an autopsy on Mr. Hembry? Yes. Okay. And did you receive Mr. Hembry in the same manner or condition that you received Mr. Picor? Yes. In, in a sealed bag? Yes. And you were the one to open it? Yes. And did you engage in the autopsy procedure the way you described, photographing yes. the body? And yes. Did you select photographs from the autopsy of Mr. Hembry that you believe would be helpful in the jury's understanding of yes. the cause and manner of death? Yes. Yes. Let's start from, I guess, the be beginning with Mr. Hembry. Can you please tell the jury generally when you first
first observed the body of Mr. Hembree, what you noticed generally as an overall? The multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, were you able to count them at first sight? Yes, and also multiple abrasions and some lacerations, you know, a lot of injuries. And the, the gunshot wounds, did they range from his thighs to his head, I'm the sorry. location of them? Yes. And Dr. Brzezowski, I'm going to go through um, the, the injuries or the gunshot wounds that you've noted, and they're in no particular order, correct? Yes. Okay. And the order we go in doesn't illustrate that that was the first shot, right? Yes. I always I have that statement uh, every single time I'm dealing with gunshot wounds that uh, the gunshot wounds will be numerically identified. The numerical identification does not necessarily indicate the sequence or severity of gunshot wound. I, simply, I, I cannot tell. Uh, can I approach the witness, Judge? You may. Roger, I'm going to show you a few exhibits here. States exhibit FE, FF, FG. FH, FI, FJ, and FK. Do you recognize the exhibits depicted in those photographs? Yes. And how do you recognize them? Well, they have exact same number, 12-484. And these are photographs that would have been conducted in the autopsy that you conducted on Mr. Hembry in September of 2012? Yes. And they fairly and accurately depict the injuries you observed after cleaning Mr. Hembury's body and photographing him. Yes. At this time, we'll move them into evidence as the next numbered exhibits. No objection. Okay, without objection, that will be. I'm sorry. One. Do you recognize uh, the what is being depicted in 151? Yes. Okay, and if you can identify the members of the jury, what what's of significance in this particular exhibit? In my report, is called perforating indeterminate range gunshot wound of head. And the number in my report is one. This is the entry wound right here. And were you able to track that particular injury or entrance wound to its exit? Yes. Okay. And where did that, what was the direction of travel for that particular bullet, the injuries it caused, and its exit point? Direction left to right, slightly back to front and upward. Okay. And when we say back to front, we're talking about the, Yes, always in an atomic position. Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Injuries that it caused on its way through? Injury. Um, that gunshot wound injured uh, the left zygomatic region. This is what we call zygomatic region. The left orbital bone, left frontal lobe of brain, corpus callosum, once again, uh, it's a part of brain, uh, right parietal lobe, and the right parietal bone. Obviously, causing multiple fractures involving all those bones that I mentioned before. And multiple, everywhere it goes through, it's going through the bones and then. So 152? What are we looking at in 152? And we are looking at the exit of the previous photograph we just looked at. Of gunshot wound number one, yes. Going through. Yes. What are we looking at there? In my report, it says perforating indeterminate range gunshot wound of neck. This is the entrance of gunshot wound number two in my report. And were you able to track that gunshot wound or that gunshot the direction of travel through the body? Yes. Can you please tell the members of the jury the direction of travel? Uh, left to right, slightly front to back, and slightly upward. And injuries that it caused on its way through? Mostly to the soft tissues, to the, uh, uh, obviously, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and muscles of the posterior neck. 
and states 154. This is the exit of gunshot wound number two in my report. The, the previous one we just looked at? Previous, yes. Stage 155. In my report is gunshot wound number three. This one, as opposed to perforating, it's penetrating because I recovered projectile in the terminate range gunshot wound of neck. And this is the entrance right here. So just to, I guess, just back up a little bit. Perforating means, explain to the members of the jury, perfor perforating, what does that mean? The perforating means I have entry and exit. Penetrating means it's entry and I recover projectile. Okay. Penetrating, perforating. Stage 156. What are we looking at in state 156? We are looking at projectiles that are recovered. It's right here. And this particular direction of travel and where the projectile ultimately rested, did it cause any injury to the neck or vertebrae? Yes. Okay. And what exactly did it do? It injured uh, skin, subcutaneous tissues, muscles, uh, partially went through the body of C5. We have seven cervical vertebras. It injured, uh, causing multiple fractures with associated multiple injuries or cervical spinal cord. And in 156, um, are we also seeing skull fractures there? Yes. And then states 157. What are we looking at in states 157? I recovered that bullet and at small fragments of jacket next to a vertebra uh, C5, that's cervical here. vertebra. That's here? That's I approach the witness? You may. Showing you FL, FM, FN, FO, FP, FQ, and FR. Do you recognize each of these photographs? Yes. And these photographs are associated with the autopsy of Mr. Hembry? Yes. And specifically, they show the injuries of the gunshot wounds that you were discussing? Yes. During right, this time, I'll tender these exhibits to the next number. No objection. Without objection, that will be 158 through 164. those yes and these are um, photographs x-rays and or evidence that was collected from the autopsy involving mr. Henry yes Performed by you 
Yes. Or this time we'll move into evidence. Any objections? Without objection, that'll be 165, 166, and 167 in evidence. I believe we are on the fourth. What are we looking at in states 158? We're looking at the entry on my report is number four, perforating once again in the terminate range gunshot foot of chest. And once again, you, you referred to this one as perforating, so you were able to track the direction of travel of this particular projectile? Yes. And where did this, um, this particular bullet hole exit the body? It exited body in uh, right mid lateral chest. And on its way through the body, did it hit any um, of the internal organs? It injured uh, right, no, lower lobe of the right lung, diaphragm, uh, right lobe of liver, and it fractured seventh left rib. Also associated with this gunshot wound, I have listed right hemothorax. This is hemothorax is accumulation of the blood in chest cavity. So it's right hemothorax and left hemothorax. If anything is in abdomen, we call it hemoperitoneum. Anything in pericardial sac, but this is not, the heart wasn't injured. So I found blood in right chest cavity, 100 cc's, and in abdomen, 800 cc's. I'm gonna show you 159. What's 159 depicting? That one. Is that the exit from the prior one? The exit from the prior. It traveled through entire chest, and then you will see it actually went through the arm. So we'll be dealing with entry, exit, re-entry, and exit. And then 161. This one. We're going to go to number five on your report. What are we looking at in states 162? Is this entry one? I'm sorry, where was it? Entry. Can you identify it on the screen, sir? Number 23, is that what we're looking at? Mm -hmm. Number 23 on the screen, is that yes, that's yes, the one you're talking about? Yes. Okay. It's hard to, to see. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. And were you able to track the direction of travel of this particular bullet? Yes. And where did it travel through? It injured, obviously, muscles, uh, liver, large and small intestines. And, and, it, and it exited where? Uh, and it exited in right lower back. Okay. States 163. That That's number? The exit. Number of five. The gunshot wound number five. Move on to number six. This is state's evidence 163. This is the entry and this is exit. It actually went just under the skin and injured a little bit muscles. Okay. So there was no fractures, there was no piercing of the chest no cavity? Fractures, nothing, no. And then moving on to number seven, do you see number seven on here? Well, it's noted as, well, it's number 25, but that you noted as the, the seventh gunshot injury. This type of wound we call grace wound, which means in the bullet didn't penetrate the skin. It just grazed the skin. So you can see injury of skin and subcutaneous tissues that is underlying the skin. Okay. 
page 165. Another perforating. 19 is entry and 18 is exit. And like previous, it only injured a little bit of subcutaneous tissues and muscles underlying the skin and that area. And in this particular gunshot, were you able to recover anything from this one? No. Are you, are you looking at, are we looking at number eight on your? We're looking at number eight. Okay. 19 to 18. 19 to 18. And then That's number eight in my report. <coughs> you, you sure you didn't recover anything from this one? If you look on page eight of your no, report. No, no, no. <coughs> Overruled. State your question again. I'm sorry. Clear on the question. Sorry. Just sorry. one moment, Doctor. All right. Let so him repeat the question. So as it, clear on the question. So we're looking at your report to refresh your memory. We're looking at the. Question. I'm going to ask my question. As it relates to injury number eight on your medical exam yes. report, did you recover anything from this particular injury? Yes. Okay. What is it that you recovered? I recovered a uh, projectile from under the skin. Okay. Showing you 166. Sorry, what exhibit number? 166. Thank you. The attorneys may approach. All right, Dr. Brzezowski, we're about halfway through the, what, the injuries that you noted on your autopsy. So if, if you don't remember from your memory every injury that is done and you need to refresh your memory from your report, if you could just let us know. Okay, fair enough? Okay. Um, can I approach the witness? Because this one's not showing well. You may. Page 166. Can you, can you show for the members of the jury what it is on 166 that's of, of importance? Right here is projectile that I described in the left upper chest area. And is that inside the chest cavity or under the skin? Where's that It's at? under the skin in the muscles. Yes, that's the bullet that I recovered from the left upper chest. Yes, the attorneys may approach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a good stopping point for the evening. So if you would just leave your notebooks on your chairs and we will lock them up for the evening. And let me give you your uh, evening recess instruction. During this break, you must continue to abide by the rules governing your service as a juror. Specifically, you're not to discuss this case among yourselves. This means no discussions about the case whatsoever, no matter where you are, including the deliberation room. Do not discuss this case with anyone else or allow anyone to discuss it in your presence. Do not speak to the attorneys, parties, or witnesses about anything. Also, do not conduct any research regarding any matters concerning this case. You must avoid reading any newspaper headlines and articles relating to this trial or its participants and you are to avoid seeing or hearing any television, radio, or internet, or social media comments about this trial, should there be any. So I'll ask you all to return tomorrow morning at 8.50 a.m., 8.50, and we'll start promptly at 9 a.m. You all have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.